Welcome, I'm Merope Mill. Um, I'm a partner and editor at Tortoise and welcome to Tortoise, especially if you haven't been before. Um, welcome to your first Think In and welcome back if you're a member or you've been to one before. It means a lot to us that you keep returning to have these conversations. Um, uh, until recently, these Think Ins were taking place in our newsroom in London and I thought I should start by explaining the idea behind a thinking. Um, the idea was uh, to create a forum for civilized disagreement and a system of organized listening that was loosely based on a sort of news organization morning conference where a, a group of journalists and experts would get together and, and you know battle around an idea to inspire some journalism at a later date. And um, you know the, cor the coronavirus has made us realize that the, new the newsroom doesn't have to be a, a physical place. It's just a place where we can all come together and talk about an important issue of the day. And that to us today is the untold stories of the coronavirus. Um, like all news conferences, uh, it works best when we hear from as many people in the room as possible. So your participation is a really, really important part of a thinking. But we do have one rule and, uh, and that is no questions. We do have lots of really interesting people on this call and I'd like to say a particular thanks to Jude at Sound Delivery uh, who's with us, who's helped bring them together. But we want to hear not questions, but your experience and your thoughts on, on the stories that we're not hearing at the moment in, the, in a lot of the media um, uh, about the coronavirus. Um, I'm just going to do a little sort of quick chat about how the whole thing works. At the bottom, if you hover over your Zoom, um, if your, your, your Zoom screen, uh, there should be something saying participants. If you click on that, uh, a little uh, box comes up, uh, a little sort of side panel with a list of names and at the bottom of that, you should see a grey box that says raise your hand and that is how uh, when you when you press that button a little blue digital hand pops up I can see a few people from my colleagues playing with it and a few other people playing with it um, and that means that I know that you've got something to say and I can come to you so please do use that button if you have something to say. Uh, the other function that you should be able to see down the bottom is chat uh, where you can write something if you want to have a, a chat rather than stick your hands up in the air. And my uh, fabulous colleague, Liz Mosley, is, is in that chat and is, uh, is able to interact with you there. Um, so weigh in with your thoughts there if you would rather. Um, uh, I should also say that you, coming onto this call, you have, you have been automatically muted, but when I come to you, uh, one of the co-hosts will unmute you so we will all be able to hear what you have to say. And I do also, have, do, do also have to say that you're being recorded so that we can edit the best bits and uh, maybe put it out to people who couldn't join us tonight who are interested in, um, in what, what's been said. Um, so I'd like to start with a little test just to make sure you understood the mechanism I was just saying by asking a question, the hands up mechanism. Um, the question I'd like to start with is who here thinks the coronavirus is, as I've seen described and told to me, a great leveller in the sense that it doesn't matter if you are Tom Hanks or Prince Charles, um, who you know obviously was diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 today, but it doesn't matter who you are, this disease will treat us all equally. Would you show me your hand if, if you think that that's the case? Just having a little look at the names. The hands keep coming up, but is it? I'm going to say it's a minority. I'm going to say it's a minority. And and the second part, if you, um, um, Liv will uh, probably put your hands down now. She has that power. Um, the second, the alternative side of that question is: Do you think our experiences are going to vary? hugely uh, based on the circumstances we find ourselves in now. Stick your hand up if you, if you think that. Just taking a little straw poll of those hands. Yeah, I, do, I think that that looks like more like the, 
more people, but still there's a lot of undecided there, it looks like. If you don't want to speak now, uh, and you don't want to be the first person to speak, um, do lower your hand. But if you do have something you want to say at this point, in response to that question, do keep your hand up, because I'd, I'd love to come to someone in the first instance if you, if you have a strong view either way on that question. I'm going to see, um, I can see someone called Math, Math Pots. Math, if that's your name. Hello, Math. Hello. Hello, Math. Can we see you? Hello. I should also hello, say that if you don't have your video app, hello, Math. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. Where are you joining us from? Uh, just near Oxford, a little place called Wallingford. Okay, and, and which way did you? Um, which way did I you don't go? know. Uh, I'm, my internet is slightly freezing, so I hope you can still hear me. We can hear you right now. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, I just wanted to. Uh, oh, sorry. That's all right. We can hear you. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. I thought you were speaking. I just wanted to uh, bring everyone's attention to Operation Wi-Fi. If you put hashtag Operation Wi-Fi, um, you can find out all about that. Some people called community organizers and Keywing are trying to get the government to lift restrictions on Wi-Fi, uh, no cap on pay as you go, and uh, open up the Wi-Fi to everyone because a lot of people are cut off and don't have the privilege of Zoom calls like this. Um, we've spoken to a lot of camarados in the camarados movement who are stuck in high-rise council flats and feeling very anxious. Um, I was talking to a chap today who started self-harming again um, because he feels completely cut off. Um, when we spoke that, you know, I, I think that contact helps and I think calls like this would help. So if people could check out Operation Wi-Fi and retweet it and get the government's attention, that would be great. So just, Matt, while I've got you, on that question of the great leveller, you are on the side of not. Not. Not, okay, and I'm just going to go to one other hand that's raised, Paul Atherton. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. <laughs> that's really interesting. Okay, um, so I'm based here at Heathrow Airport. It's uh, where I've been living for the past year, but it's just usually basically where I get my, lay my head down. But obviously now it's kind of where we're all ended up and stuck. So there's about 100, maybe 150 homeless people residing here at the moment. Um, obviously, Sadiq Khan, before the weekend, was suggesting that there was going to be hotel rooms released. Um, that was supposed to be a trial, but uh, you may have heard already in the news this afternoon, uh, both Travel Lodge and Premier Inn now have evicted anybody that was staying in their hotels, either housed there by the council or placed there under this sort of voluntary scheme that was running although the majority of those, I believe, actually were in a different chain. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, we, we're not being listened to at all. Um, there are a lot of organizations like Streets Kitchen, the Museum of Homelessness, Street Storage, uh, kind of shouting that this needs to be addressed in a hurry, and the government and the mayor's office don't seem to be addressing or caring one jot at this juncture. Paul, can I, can I ask you, you say there are 150 people you, so you you're homeless and you yep. often reside at, at Heathrow. I do. 150 is is a presumably a lot more than there are usually homeless people at Heathrow Airport. Um, I I, I mean I, I actually physically did a count uh, the night before last. Um, I would suggest because I'm only in Terminal Five, um, so a lot of people segregate around the bus station. Uh, at Terminal 3 and also in Terminals 1, 2, 3 and 4. Can I just check that I'm the only one, as I've lost, have I, have I, has everyone lost Paul there? Perhaps we can come back to him later because I think his situation is, is, is really interesting but he seems to have frozen right now. Um, can I, can I um, come to my colleague Claudia? Are you there Claudia? Um, Claudia is one of the writers of um, one of the tortoise, so there's a tortoise email, sense maker I know a lot of you get, um, if, if you're not a member of tortoise and you're interested in, in, in getting the sense maker and all our other journalistic products, um, we, we are having a 30 day free trial at the moment, uh, if you go to the app store and download tortoise, you can get the sense maker, all our journalism and see all our other thinkings coming up, so do do that if you enjoy this experience. But Claudia, can I just talk to you about something you wrote about um, this morning in SenseMaker, which is the situation with coronavirus and refugees, which is something that 
I don't think I've seen written about in many places at all. What's your view of what's happening, you know, in, 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 uh, around the world? So I think you're right. It has been quite underreported. If you think about there's currently 25 million refugees in the world and 40 million internally displaced people. The best example of that is probably the Greek islands like Lesbos, where you've got, particularly on Lesbos, I think there's over 20,000 people sharing space, which is intended for two to 3,000 people. So these are overcrowded, unsanitary, very dangerous condition, um, conditions to be living in. And if you consider how important social distancing is, that is just not something that's going to be feasible in these places. There's, I think it was in the New York Times, there was an interview with a Syrian aid worker who was saying something on the lines of, you know, you want me to wash my hands? People here don't wash their children for a week. So the idea that everyone can practice socially distant, social distancing, I think isn't true. So that, that's just my kind of response to the, you know, leveling idea. But I think this is going to be a real problem unless we deal with it properly, because obviously if one person in these camps gets coronavirus, it is just going to spread. And really these are places which have insufficient medical supplies and protections anyway. So if you take into account testing and all that kind of thing, it, they are just going to be completely overwhelmed by the crisis. And it's something that I think richer nations really have to deal with and have to deal with quickly. I know the intention is probably there, but I think at the moment when there's a real risk that rich nations will prioritise their home economies and people in their own countries. And while I accept that there might be a, an impetus for that, this, you know, these, this crisis, this humanitarian crisis isn't going to go away and it risks turning into, uh, you know, a humanitarian crisis plus a health crisis. And I do think it's something that we should be talking about more and that we should be really considering. I think also possibly linked to that is um, the idea that this isn't something that's not happening in the UK. If you think about detention centres like Yarlswood yeah. in the UK, which has had an incident of coronavirus. I think there have been people that have been removed from Yarlswood now, but there are still people there. This idea, we need to kind of tackle the migrant crisis alongside coronavirus at the moment. They're not separate issues. It's definitely a story that needs to be told. I, I've been told that Paul is back on. Paul, are you there and can you hear me? Are you? Or can you Hi, hear me? Hi, we, we, we lost you for a moment there. <laughs> that, um, that was the Wi-Fi at Heathrow kicking me off. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, uh, uh, you're back seamlessly. Um, just, just, uh, I just wanted to ask about the mood of, you know, I, I think other people are avoiding airports, you know, like the, yeah, it's terrible. Proverbial plague, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you don't have that luxury. And, and, and you know, what is the mood there? Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure it's suddenly incredibly empty, but, and the only people there are, are homeless, but... It's I, I, it's really funny because the, the 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 airport's kind of operating on a, a low key basis, but there are still quite a lot of people uh, coming through. And it, um, the, you know, we just had a bunch of Italians come through. There was a Chinese flight this morning. Um, I think the general mood amongst most people is just lack of knowledge. Everybody's really frustrated because from the weekend there was this sort of level of hope that actually things were going to get sorted. The hotel rooms were, were on the horizon. And then, of course, that's vanished. And worse than that, then things have gone dead silent. So we're all kind of stuck in this limbo where, you know, networks are, are, are working across London. So, as I say, like, like Streets Kitchen. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting constant feedback about what's going on. But they're struggling now because they can't even find a kitchen in central London by which to cook food to be able to distribute to the homeless. Okay. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us about it. I can see a couple of hands up, but before I go to you, Jennifer and Louise, I will come to you. I just want to talk to Sue um, James, uh, who is a solicitor who works uh, with homeless courts. And, um, you know, I, we had quite an interesting discussion this morning because, the, as you were saying about, you know, a lot of hope at the weekend, the headlines that have come out of it are um, that nobody will lose their home, nobody will be evicted because of the coronavirus. That is that is what the um, the government promised. And in, in reality, Sue, what has happened? Yeah, um, those were the headlines, and we were really pleased by receiving those headlines. But I think whoever's making the decision were not aware of the the current procedure is for cases to be listed for like six to eight weeks in the court. 
So although the government was saying no new evictions, we're already six to eight weeks worth blocked out. Um, so last week, um, we closed down the office at the Law Centre for remote working. And at the same time, we were thinking, well, what's going to happen with the duty scheme? Because the way that the cases are run, that they're listed hourly and you might have 10, 15 people turn up each hour. So in the court waiting room, you might have about 30, 35 people at any one time, including clients, their family, solicitors. And the way that you operate is that you've never met these people before. They're facing eviction. They're having to turn up to, to save their home. You've got to talk to a landlord agent or another solicitor and then go in before the judge. And I thought, this is crazy. The government is saying that we have to remote, be remote working and we have to social distance. And my team at Hammersmith and Fulham have got to go to court on Friday. So I wrote to the judges um, last Wednesday, got a very early response Thursday morning saying that they were taking this seriously. Um, at the same time, we had a response from one of my colleagues at the Law Centre Network to say that there was a fantastic judge in, um, in Exeter Combined Court who had adjourned all of the housing cases between now and the 19th of June to protect every single person. So no new cases coming forward. The ones in the system were going to be adjourned. Um, but that hasn't happened for all courts. And as the days have gone on, we've been fighting and kind of trying to get this in the media. And, and Owen Bocart did a fantastic article on Sunday that went out in The Guardian. Um, because not only was this going on for, for possessions, um, that you know, people, jurors were being expected to turn up to court if their trials were less than three days. And colleagues of mine who are criminal lawyers were still expected to go to court and to see anybody who turns up. And one of my colleagues was um, duty solicitor on Saturday at Croydon Magistrates. Um, but I mean, what you won't know is that the courts have been so underfunded for so long, 40% reduction in funding for the justice system, that there were no proper facilities and so you go to court. So Brentford County Court is the court that we go to on a Friday. And that hasn't had any, any hot water for more than a year because the boiler broke and they won't fix it. Um, the Monday before last, there was no soap. You know, you turn up, there's no soap, there's no hand dryers, there's no paper towels. And this is consistent across the board. And it, it's just seemed that whatever the government was putting out in terms of announcements, it wasn't the reality on the ground. And I think... On Friday, my colleague Renata went to court and a young woman who was pregnant turned up and another woman who had lupus turned up to save their homes and were placed in, you know, quite challenging circumstances being with other people. Um, a family turned up completely masked up on the, and were asked why they were sitting in the court with masks on. Um, and they told the usher that they were displaying symptoms, but they felt they had to go to court um, in order to save their home. Um, so that was Friday. It's now Wednesday and things have started to change, but still it's not consistent. So the housing um, communities and local government have said, you know, no new evictions, no evictions presently, but not all courts are doing that. Um, and we need a firm direction around these issues so that there aren't any evictions because, um, you know, some courts are saying, well, let's go remote and let's list these cases remotely. But the reality is that what you're doing is you're going to evict someone in the next three months. Or if the case is adjourned, you are going to um, ask that person to get evidence, to get documents to bring back to court on another day. And so not, you know, the reality is no evictions between now and June, and then let's see what the position is. Okay, thank, thank you, Sue, that's, a, that's incredibly interesting. I, I'd love to come to Louise Tickle, who's had her hands up for a while, her, 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 her um, digital hand. Louise, yes. are you there? Yes, I am, and can you hear me okay? Yes. Hello, Louise. Hi. Um, so, yes, interesting that you were talking about courts. Um, I write about, I'm, I'm a journalist, I write about child protection and the family court system. And the family courts are really struggling desperately at the moment. 
Um, but I think the, the, the sections of, of kind of family groups that I'm most concerned about at the moment, having just written a piece um, about the care system for Guardian that was published today, is, is actually the, the families that don't have any oversight from social workers because they may have been involved with social work in the past because the children were at risk, but those cases are now closed. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the family isn't in a really fragile situation, whether that's to do with poverty or domestic abuse. They might have a very disabled child. They might have a parent with mental health difficulties. Um, and there is nobody at the moment who is charged with having any oversight of those families. And those children, of course, now don't have the oversight of being at school five days a week um, with the practical care of professionals. Um, so even that very bare bones oversight isn't there. Um, I'm also uh, really concerned about people who are living in coercive and controlling relationships um, where if you are forced to isolate in your home with your abuser, um, who can then exert almost complete, if not complete control over your life, um, you are in a very desperate position and you have nowhere to go. And I would imagine that the services that you would normally have recourse to are so stretched that it's going to be almost impossible, you know, for instance, to go to your GP, um, to call the police. I'm sure you can call them, but I would imagine they have a lot of other stuff to do. Um, if you are high risk and were referred to a MARAC, I'm not quite, a MARAC is um, a multi-agency risk assessment conference. I think Polly Neat will um, correct me if, um, if I got that wrong. Uh, but these are the multi-agency conferences that try to mitigate risk for the highest risk victims of domestic abuse. And, and how much of that is happening, I really don't know. And finally, um, I'm seeing a lot of parents on my Twitter feed who um, are separated acrimoniously uh, who may or may not have a court order around contact with children. And remember, those, those disputes, those battles in family courts can go on for years. Uh, and then you finally get a court order, and you may not be happy with it, but in the end, hopefully, people, you know, obey it. But um, although children can, um, under the exceptions, go between people's homes, and that was clarified yesterday, um, I do know of parents who are telling me that wherever the child is at the moment, um, they're not being allowed to come home. And so the distress to the, you know, that child who isn't allowed to see that other parent, um, and again, these will be completely private matters. There will be no oversight by any social care. Um, and there's, I think there's a huge potential for children to really suffer who, who have no statutory involvement at all. Okay. Thank you, Louise. Um, there's, there's somebody called the FRG office who has put up their digital hand. I think that's not your... your Hi. 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 Okay, sorry, it's Cathy Ashley. I'm not the FRG office. I'm, I'm their chief exec for Family Rights Group. Um, I just wanted to what, raise, because it followed... Would you, would you say what your name is before you start? Sorry, it's Cathy Ashley. Ja sorry, Jackie Ashley. Cathy. Cathy. Cathy, Cathy Ashley. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So we work with families who are involved in the child welfare system. And uh, I wanted to raise three sort of related points to that which Louise has raised. One is we are getting lots of people contacting us about contact, but that includes parents whose children are in the foster care system or um, who aren't living with them, but where uh, children's services are involved. And they're getting very, um, sometimes very harsh advice about when they will be able to see their children again. And some local authority, some local, I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that lots of local authorities and social workers, etc., are working extremely hard to try and make sense of an extremely difficult situation um, but we are getting some very harsh um, decisions being made which contravene the law but the reality is that those parents really don't have redress because they're uh, they don't have access to a lawyer to go to court particularly at the moment and they're being told not just that they can't uh, see their child in person but also very limited in terms of uh, virtual contact. Um, 
The second thing I wanted to raise was relatives who are raising children who can't live with their parents. Uh, about 200,000 children in that situation, half of whom are living with grandparents who uh, may have underlying health concerns. Again, uh, a significant number of those will be under the radar in relation to Louise's point, but we do need to have a much more community um, nuanced way of being able to help families in very severe stress. And the third um, point I wanted to raise was that of teenagers and care leavers, uh, care leavers particularly being exceptionally isolated at the moment. Um, and in relation to teenagers, I think one of our fears about the way in which the bill has on through is the way in which parents could be blamed for teenagers not conforming in relation to social isolation and how difficult it is in relation to particularly uh, teenagers who may have severe uh, emotional behaviours, mental health problems or being exploited uh, already outside the home. Okay, so actually that's, uh, thank you very much, Cathy. That's, um, that seems like a good moment to introduce one of our uh, guests who uh, I think is around, it's Simeon, his name is under Zim, I think on, on, Simeon, are you there? Don't, um, I don't know if we can spot him in, Simeon? Hello. Hello, Simeon. Uh, I don't know if you can turn your camera on, but uh, Simeon, uh, the, the reason I'm coming to you now, so Cathy was just making the point about parents blamed for, you know, um, if their if their teens don't follow the the uh, social isolation rules, and I know you've worked with uh, you know gang members uh, uh, before, and we had quite an interesting conversation about whether we thought that they were going to abide by the uh, social isolation rules. What's what's your view on that? Um, well, at the moment, I believe most people are because um, just in fear of what's happening around the virus. Um, and what they're hearing about people dying because it's becoming very real. People are dying that we know and, and things like that. So I think people will, will abide by the rules for a minute. So you think crime could, could, would in the, short, in the short term go down? I've, I've, I think so. But saying that, some, saying that there was a shooting yesterday or today and I think someone got murdered in Small Heath. Um, mm. So, but I, 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 I do believe that... Um, the violence will drop between um, the between the youth themselves because um, we're facing a bigger problem. But then, the more pressure we get put under, um, I mean, just the, the, more, the more pressure we get put under, it's, it's very it's very dangerous because then people start to um, act on animal instinct and 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 start to show negative behavior if they've got no understanding of what's going on and how to even knowing what to do we and, and, and on, Simeon, something else you said to me was that um you you felt like people might react against ultimately react against having their freedoms curtailed that they're abiding at the moment but that there might be a sense that this is just a a, a long-term a long-term change and people would react to that I, I, I believe I believe so because um, what I've, from a lot of the people that I've spoke to, it, they've spoke about losing their freedoms more than the vibe than than the actual virus. So there's loads of things to look at um, with within what's go what's what's going on. A lot of focus is on the virus, but there's a lot of other things that's and and all of it together is scaring people. Mm. Because, they, because they don't understand what's going on and they're just hearing about it. So things like the 5G being put up, um, they're hearing that it's harmful, they're hearing it's killing people. Um, um, and, then, and then with the virus on top and then with the laws being taken away. So people are hearing that your kids can be taken away, your children can be quarantined. Mm -hmm. um, if and, and a lot of people have, um, are in fear of that. So I've, I think... I think that needs to be addressed because on social media, it's the, all is pushed. You're not, it's only fear that's being pushed. Yeah. Like, in terms fear of, the, lies, yeah. it's only fear that's being pushed. There's nothing positive 
Yeah. Um, Social media does feed fear and it feeds misinformation, which uh, oh. talked, yeah. piece, talked to about this week. That, Simeon, thank you very much. And thanks for, for um, bringing that to the table. I just want to go to another uh, couple of hands that are there. Mark Bar Baker. Mark Baker, you've had your hand up a while. Hello, Mark. Hi there. Can you hear me all? Yes. Hello, Mark. Thank hi, you. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, I thought I'd change the subject slightly and talk to you all about the... Uh, impact on the world of employment that this virus is having. Um, I'm, uh, a, I represent sub-postmasters um, nationally for, on behalf of the Communication Workers Union and my sector has been designated as essential workers. Um, so we're, we're all on the front lines uh, continuing to provide access to banking and access to the post as well as access to utilities for people to carry on um, living their lives as best they can whilst we're in this lockdown. Um, <clears throat> but uh, one thing uh, that has completely taken me by surprise is uh, just how bad employers are treating their workforce. Um, people are just being slung out of work. Yes, there is some government help when that happens, but it just seems that a lot of employers are taking advantage of some of the more spurious terms of employment that they've been allowed to have with their employees, um, you know, short term working hours contracts, um, serial hours contracts, uh, all that sort of thing. It, it's, it's no better in my industry, which um, is a government owned company in the day, the post office owns, the government owns the post office. And although we've been asked to stand on the front line and continue to serve the public, because of the way we are paid, which is commission only, and we haven't got any customers coming in because they've all been told to stay at home, but we have to stay there and serve, serve the occasional few that come in. Our pay is virtually gone. So we are spending eight to 12 hour days standing there, not getting very much money at all. And because we are classed as being self-employed, again, because of a, a, a spurious contractual arrangement with the post office, we have no idea whether or not we're going to get any help from the government. We know our employees will get help by being furloughed off on 80% wages, but where does this leave the postmaster? And my concern is because sub offices are notoriously badly paid and are teetering on the edge anyway before any of this started, I'm just concerned that um, if this carries on for too much longer, it will bring about the end of the sub post office network which will be absolutely devastating for urban deprived and rural areas. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for your contribution. I'd, I'd love to come now to Marissa, um, who I've, I've uh, uh, Marissa, are you there? Uh, I, Hi, Marissa. Hi, Marissa, Hi, Marissa you, you're, you're a domestic worker and, um, and you, you run an organization on behalf of domestic workers. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I just wondered if you would give us a little picture of, of what it's like for domestic workers right now with the coronavirus. Mm. So basically domestic workers are those uh, workers who are working in private households. So they are looking after children and elderly and but also do the general housework. So that's the domestic workers. Now, uh, since the beginning, um, there are already domestic workers who have been stopped from working. Uh, they, will, uh, they were asked to, to stay at home in, the, in their workplace. Uh, if they dare to go out, then they have this threat of losing their job. So automatically they would be terminated. So, but the problem we have of that also, uh, we receive complaint of while they are restricted to go outside, uh, the employers are not uh, giving them food. So, and those who are live, so this is the live, live this is the one of the problem. And those who are stopped from going to the work, they say they have, they are live out. Uh, domestic workers, um, they didn't receive salary. So on the last day, they just asked to pack their things and they didn't give them money or they didn't say anything. So live, that live in do domestic workers are do being deprived of freedoms and live out domestic workers 
are losing yeah. money from I mean, their entire salaries. Yeah. As being terminated and not being paid, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, there's no uh, certainty are they still going back to that work after the virus. So it's, everything is uncertain. So um, right now, uh, we could support some of them because two weeks ago, we put up a funding appeal and there are people who donated money. So. Since as of Monday, I, we've already started to, uh, to, to deliver food, to transfer cash uh, to them. So those who still could go out then can buy. But those who couldn't really go out, then uh, there are volunteers. Uh, we also have our trusty who are helping. Also, we have our volunteers to choose turn to become deliveries, you know, to deliver food. So we've been doing that since Monday. And even today, I've been doing, even I'm in the hospital, I've been doing that, uh, passing the name and addresses who need it. And uh, I don't know, how, I, I don't think so we could survive this way in the long run. So yeah. I think it's, it's, it's really a, a huge problem. But also I think uh, those domestic workers who are renting, of course, they couldn't afford to, to to pay the rent without, you know, without work, without pay. And uh, it is becoming a problem now. And also, um, I think just before I, I come to this hospital, I posted my inhaler to one of them. Because, you know, there are also undocumented workers who couldn't access uh, um, me me medical treatment, you know, like... I'm sorry, are you in the hospital right now? I'm in the hospital because this morning I was sent by my GP for diabetes. My sugar is very high. But I think it's come down now, so I think they, they will let me out. I don't know. I still need one more test tonight. Okay. So that's why I say you do me first because uh, they, they will distract me again. Okay. Uh, Marissa, I can't believe you've joined us from hospital, but thank you so much because... Yeah. Um, you know, it's so rare that you hear the voice of the domestic workers in the media, and I'm really, yeah. really grateful for you taking. So our fund, our funding appeal is in our Twitter. That's the voice of domestic workers in the like page in the website, uh, the voice of domestic workers .com. So I'm hoping uh, there are people who would uh, help, and uh, we could we could continue our our work. But I just want to say thank you. You know, even they are not uh, they are not. They, there are people around London in every borough, you know, that are working really to, to help those who really need it. And I know they're delivering food, you know, to, to yeah. others. Sometimes we get, we get, we reach out to them. If none of our volunteers is available, yeah. then uh, we reach out to them and they are there to help. Um, but I hope everybody will do their part, you know, to contain yeah. this virus. And I think the government is not really doing enough, you know. Domestic workers are not even covered in what they call, you know, that uh, if they lost their job, then they, they could have this, you know, this salary of 80%. They're not even covered. And they, they also are frontline workers, you know, as scared to children, as scared to elderly, you know. And um, so I think if they should cover everybody. And also, I think what we are having is not really a, a lockdown, but it's just a precautionary measures. Yeah. I think we need to think of locking down uh, as soon as possible, you know. Thank you. Marissa, thank you so much. Um, get well, stay safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for all right. your support on behalf of all the domestic workers. Um, uh, I'm just going to, um, I think, just, I'd love to go to um, Polly Neat. Um, I'm going to come to you, Grace Wild, in a second. I, I can see you've had your hand up for a while, but I think Polly Neat, the CEO of Shelter, is that Polly? Hi. There? <laughs> yes, that's me. Hi. Hello. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I understand you've been trying but not able to put your hand up, but uh, you have things to say and we, we, we would love oh. to hear them. Well, I, I just, in a way, I think all of this goes back to your original question about is this going to be a leveller? And the answer from me has to be 100% not because 
all of the groups we're talking about, you know, we are being told to stay at home on the assumption that we have a reasonably safe home to stay in. And all the people we're talking about, people who simply cannot afford anywhere to live, that's a lot of people nowadays, um, people who are on very low wages like domestic workers and other people in the gig economy on zero hours contracts, uh, people who are experiencing domestic violence, all of those people uh, are being told to stay at home and they simply can't. And the fact of it is there's, there's hardly anywhere for them to go. There, there is nowhere to go. And that's the problem. And what we are seeing at Shelter is, <clears throat> pardon me, is um, a lot of uh, particularly single parent families uh, headed by women. Many of them have fled domestic abuse uh, and some of the situations Louise Tickle was talking about, um, who are finding themselves in bed and breakfast hotels. Uh, they're living in one room with all of their children. They're sharing kitchens and bathrooms. This is the reality of what people will experience uh, if they lose their home in this crisis. Mm. And so what's happening is um, the, all the, uh, the services that would have, such as they still were, that would have reached out to people uh, at risk of losing their home or in very dangerous and difficult situations like abusive relationships, those services are reduced so drastically. And then if people do end up homeless, uh, they are in a, a, a totally intolerable situation. It isn't that the government aren't doing anything. They are doing stuff, but they're working on a, on a, on a base, if you like, um, where you have got vast numbers of people who are far too vulnerable mm. to be able to benefit from the measures that are being taken or to be able to follow the advice that people are being given. It's right for someone like me, here I am in my nice house, you know, uh, social distancing. You know, I'm not sitting in a bed and breakfast hotel with my kids, quite scared to go into the corridor outside to use the shared kitchen or the mm. shared bathroom that I have to use, you know. so. Is it a leveller? A hundred percent not. What I hope is that it will actually draw attention to um, the uh, really dangerous situation that so many of our fellow citizens are in. And that when we actually come out of this, of course, we need more done now. But maybe when we come out of this, we will all be looking for a leveller. That's what that would be my kind of dream. Um, that it will have that impact on all of us and we'll really want something different and be prepared to pay for it is a big one. Thank you, Polly. That's one of the things we've actually been talking about as editors is what, what will the legacy of coronavirus be? Will it be a more fair society? Let's hope so. C can I come to Grace who's had her hand up for a while? Hello, Grace. Hi. Sorry, um, I didn't realise I'd had it on for so long. Um, I just wanted, it's a really tiny point, I just wanted to bring into the conversation and to Tortoise's reporting on this, which is that underpinning pinning all of these really concerning challenges is the prediction that the charity sector itself is going to lose over £4 billion pounds over the next 12 weeks so whilst demand is going to rise exponentially um, more than it already was under 10 years of austerity income from community groups right through to big organizations is going to plummet um, and and very little has been done by the government to um to support charities at this time and there is there is things are moving on that front but um but just to add if, if there's anything tortoise can do when reporting on this issue to add that um into the mix um, because, yeah, uh, between four and five billion is being predicted to be lost from the community and voluntary sector. OK, thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you for that. And um, uh, is it Augusta Robson? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Was it Robson Augusta? Why did I Robson say Augusta. I don't know why I said it the wrong way around. Trust me, my, my, <laughs> I've had my physics teacher for three years and she's done got it right. Um, yeah, I, I I'm currently doing my A-levels and I'm year 12 on my first so wait, book. So wait, you, you were currently doing your A-levels but you're not anymore. No, I, I am. I am currently doing my A-levels. With school closures, it's still, it's over the internet. I'm the first year of my A-levels, so I've... First year, so you yeah, have not, yeah. you know, you, well, you're we have still on track. Still, we're, yeah. we're, we're still on track, but we've still got, we're, we don't know what's going to happen because, of course, we, I've got my university to apply for in September. We are oh, September, October, December yeah. time. We still don't know how that's going to work because we were met to have our, all our mock exams in the next couple of months. Of course, mm. they've been put on hold. Mm. 
So we, we haven't been told if the university will be leading it with our applications for uni. They say, and I've got friends in the air below me and the air above who, um, when we when it came out, we, our last day was Thursday because we couldn't keep the school life, we'd have enough staff. Mm. Um, we did, we, none of us knew what was going to happen. I had, we had people crying because they thought, because they thought it was off their mock grade. And if you went off my, what I got in my marks, I would have failed English. I would have done very well in my history. I'm dyslexic. I, I struggle with mm. writing. I got a U in, in both my English GCC mocks, but managed to pass them in my actual exams. So people just being thrown out and not really know what's going on. It's been a massive... And if there's still a lot of uncertainty now about how those grades, are, how people are going to be graded amongst your friends in the year above and the year below. So your friends in the year above taking yeah. A-levels, year below GCSEs. Yeah. yeah. Um, they sort of understand that it's, it's going to be off their mocks and what teachers going to do, but that, of course, is it's going to be, it's up to appeal really now because they, it, it depends how lenient teachers are going to be, how much evidence they've got for this. Some teachers test more than others. Some teachers have worked, some don't. I've had to, I'm, I, I did some tutoring for a, a, two girls in the year below me and I have one of their maths papers I, need, I had to go and deliver today because they need it in case, just in case they need more evidence. So it's very, it's very tricky about the situation they're in currently. Thank you. It's Robson. Yes, Robson. Yeah. Thank you, Robson. <laughs> Thank you, Robson, for, for telling us about that. And another couple of hands, because I see we're running out of time. Um, is it Jennifer Allerton? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, there was interesting hearing from Robson. So I work for um, a company that runs online activities for schools. So we've actually seen a well, we've got a massive workload at the moment for a very small team um, because we're trying to ramp up capacity for the summer term. Um, we've been trying to look as much as possible into the different ways that schools are coping with this. Um, so some have online learning environments. Most schools these days use that sort of thing. Um, we are trying to get teachers to sort of have a way to keep in touch with their students um, through our site as well. So normally it would be online science engagement activities. The students join a chat and they chat to scientists um, and they do this from their classroom. Um, but we're trying to get them sort of logging in from home. We see a massively varied um, approach from different schools in them telling us what they're doing at the moment and how they're structuring um, contacting their students. So I had one teacher say today they're only really having much contact with their students about once a week um, mm. when they upload all the work for their following week for their each year group. Um, and that's about as much contact as they have. Um, and it's also, we're very aware of the fact that it's going to affect different students within the same school incredibly differently. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. No, thank you, Jennifer. I, I, the reason I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to cut you off. It's just That's right, it's we, we, we have quite a time on the hour yeah. Zoom and there are a couple of other people I want to go to. I, I'd love to go to uh, a couple of people I spoke earlier to in the day. One of them is Darren Marinas. Um, uh, Darren, I, I, I would just love it if you could quickly talk about um, some of the things you said to me about, you know, the panic buying and the effect on the people that you work with. Yeah, of um, course, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's been difficult for some of the people we work with and some of our members. Um, quite a, a number of the folk we're, we're involved with are, are on universal credit. And, and we have seen over the last couple of weeks, the, you know, the immense panic buying by people who, who are financially sort of off. And often the, the people we're working with rely on, you know, sometimes very small independent um, shops on housing estates and stuff like that. And, and what we've noticed just recently is obviously when people are finally, it's great news that, you know, they're getting a bit of extra money on universal credit. But when they're trying to get to the, the you know, the supermarkets or stuff that, you know, most of that stuff is gone. So unfortunately, then they're, they're going back to, you know, to some of these independent stores. And what we're seeing is massive 
cry sites, you know, that we know people already living in poverty, you know, pay more for things like energy and food anyway. But in these extreme, you know, testing times and circumstances, we've, been, we've seen people taken advantage of, you know. I've seen places who, who are selling, you know, one pound hand wash for eight pound, you know, um, cowpaw for children, 10 pound. A scandal, yeah. Paracetamol, two pound, eighteen p a pack, and 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 but these people have no other choices, you know, no other choices whatsoever, uh, because there's you know there's nothing left in the supermarkets, unfortunately, for these people to to get. Thank you, thanks, Darren. And there's somebody you introduced me to who I hope is also on the line somewhere. Phil, um, I don't know if you're there, Phil. Uh, if you are. Could you put your hand up? Is that Phil Parks? Yeah. Phil, so, you know, you you were really particularly interesting to talk to to me because you are a, a recovering addict. And um, to you, you know, the social structure of your day is something that's really kept you going and kept you on the straight and narrow. So you're having your own sort of struggle with your own demons. Am I right? Uh, yes, it's, it's, I'd say like the past 11 months since I've, being sober, the way that I've, like, with my mental health as well, which wasn't a great help, but the, the way I've stayed sober, the way I've stayed staying, is being able to go into Darren's office, where I volunteer on a, on a regular basis, and just be able to talk, having, and having that social interaction, talk, and not be caught up in my own head on a daily basis, has kept me sober, it's kept me going, and not having that, it's, it's been a bit of a struggle, to be honest. Okay, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I, you know, I, I can imagine you said to me on the phone that you felt your first reaction to all of this was a really sort of selfish one that you felt quite bad about because you said, you know, how am I going to get through that? But I imagine a lot of people are in a, a similar situation, and I don't think you should feel guilty for having those thoughts. I can imagine it's in, incredibly difficult for you right now. Um, I, I'm so sorry to be short with you, uh, Phil. I'm just quite conscious of time and a couple of people who've had their hands up for a while. Somebody called Blue Forks. Hello, Blue? Hey, uh, Hello, Blue. Hey. Sorry, is my camera still off? If you, if you could put your camera on so we could see hey, you, yeah. terrific. Thank you. Hey, Hi. Uh, Hi. Oh gosh, my camera's with rubbish. <laughs> um, so hi, my name's Blue. I work with a little charity called Umbrella Lane. We're based in Scotland um, and we work with sex workers, which is a very underreported topic, especially at times like this, um, because yeah. sex workers, like everybody else, need to earn a living. And when you tell us that we have to self-isolate and not see anyone, then where does the income come from? Um, so we're having to deal with a lot of people getting in touch with us and being like, what do I do? How do I keep myself safe from the coronavirus? How do I make enough money to pay my bills? My kids aren't at school. How can I work? Um, and there's just a lot of fear and a lot of panic. And we work with a lot of different groups. So some people are perfectly fine and can either switch to doing online sex work or they can just take a break while all of this is happening and blows over but we have started a little fundraiser um that um we're hoping to be able to provide an emergency fund sort of a hardship fund so we've got a little bit of money sorted kind of and we're trying to help the community in that way um annoyingly our twitter got restricted because we shared the um, Gender Recognition Act and some tariffs got mad, but that's but, a whole other. But you're, um, you're absolutely right when we talk about the stories that we haven't, that we don't hear about, sex workers and how they earn a living. Living is is definitely one. So thank thank you very much for bringing um, that point of view. Just I think I've just got time for maybe one more hand before I have to sum up. Is, is it Kamna Mur? I don't know how to, I'm not going to try and say your surname, Kamna. That's Hello, fine. Kamna. Yes, it's Kamna Murli there. And I just wanted to raise the issue around kind of racial justice and actually the impact on um, black and brown communities that are going to kind of experience, exacerbate kind of already existing inequalities. You know, that might be in terms of digital exclusion, um, 
the lack of kind of opportunity to self-isolate, social distance, because a lot of these communities live in crowded, small areas, large families, lots of people together. Um, but also on kind of the education point around, you know, the number of young black and brown uh, children who will be missing during their GCSEs and A-levels this year. And at the talk of kind of that being replaced by teacher assessments and the amount of bias that that is going to creep in and impact on their future. So I don't think, you know, I think um, even with the charity sector, if we talk about black and brown led organizations that are already really under-resourced and underfunded, who are often the kind of only link for a lot of these really vulnerable communities, um, that really worries me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, you know, as I said at the start, I'm quite conscious of uh, time, the, the uh, Zoom only allows us to have an hour, so we have to be strict um, with it. And so I'm just gonna try and sum up some of the uh, really interesting ideas and things that have been said this evening. I, I'm, I'm gonna start first of all by apologizing for the lighting on me. I didn't have the main room light on and I feel like I've been quite spookily lit the whole time with this uh, strange lamp light. So apologies for that. But um, uh, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to Paul Atherton living uh, in Heathrow along with 100 and around 149 other uh, homeless people uh, and doing the count in Terminal 5. You know, seeing the scene for that, Paul, it was, it's, it's really interesting to hear your point of view and, and to see that people are still coming through, but in the midst of it, there's a group of homeless people scared and, and not knowing what's going to happen to them. So thank you very much for starting us off like that. Thank you to my, my colleague Claudia for talking about the uh, refugee situation. Uh, 25 million refugees uh, living in camps where social distancing distancing is just unfeasible and not an option and, and that seems to be a story that people are not writing about. Um, uh, to Sue uh, who talked about uh, the rate of evictions, the 20,000 current evictions that are still going through the courts and also uh, the detail of the sort of you know we've heard a lot about the impact of the uh, cuts on the NHS in the last uh, few years and the impact but the 40% reduction in funding for the criminal justice system you know the no soap the no hand dryer that's it's, it's really shocking to hear you know pregnant women people with lupus people infected going to courts because they have no other choice. Um, Louise you, you brought up something that was on my mind that the people are uh, in coercive and controlling relationships being forced to isolate with their abuser. Uh, I can't imagine what that's like, uh, let alone the parents who have separated acrimoniously and children caught in the, in the middle of that. Um, there's, a, there's really interesting stories to be told um, there. And um, I think it was Simeon who talked about, you know, the, the sense that people were losing freedoms um, and, and that was concerning them more than the actual virus, which was very interesting. And Robson talking about, you know, kids and their uh, struggling to come to terms with losing their GCSEs and, 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 and A levels. Um, uh, uh, Polly, you um, you you came back to my question. You know, is this going to be a great leveler? And uh, uh, Polly Neat from Shelter, your view is absolutely not that that there are really vulnerable people working in our society. The gig economy workers, you know, zero hours contract workers domestic workers that Marissa talked um, really interestingly about. And thank you to Marissa so much for joining us from hospital of all places to give that point of view. Um, and, and the sex workers that Polly talked about, uh, you know, these are all people that, that have stayed out of the headlines which are dominated by the Prince Charles. And it's, it's really been um, uh, really interesting to hear what's happening to them as, you know, services that they would have reached out to are becoming gradually less and less available. Um, I'd love to end uh, with, you know, to share Polly's, um, Polly's hope that, uh, that this situation will draw attention to uh, the dangerous situation that we've in by underfunding our public services and hope that it will become a leveller in the future, even if it's not now. So um, thank you all for bringing your point of view. I'd, I'd also like to say, if you've enjoyed uh, this Tortoise Thinking, please do uh, go to the App Store, download Tortoise, try our four week trial where you get access to all the other thinkings we're doing, um, uh, the four weeks free, you can read our SenseMaker email, which tries to make sense of this incredibly confusing and difficult time. Um, and of course our award winning journalism that we do off the back of these thinkings. So thank you so much for joining us and please do come again and thank you all for your uh, contributions. Hope to see you again. <laughs>